نحمده نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ به من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضلنا ومن يضلله فلا هادينا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريكنا وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد أنا أثنك أن أبريز الله تبارك وتعالى who has given us the opportunity to come together by way of any a live broadcast, a mixler, to speak about and to discuss a important topic في غاية الأهمية any that is of the utmost importance a topic that should be nasbu ayun al mu'minin that should be the focus of the eyes of the believers at all time and in every circumstance and situation no matter when a person finds himself or where a person finds himself or herself and it is the matter of al izz any of the dignity of the believer and the honor of the believer and this theme that I was asked to discuss around Asbab al-Nasr the means of victory and al-Izz and the means of the dignity of the Ummah that are found in the statement of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala Ya ayyuha ladhina amanu إن تنصر الله ينصركم ويثبت قدامكم. O oh, you who believe, if you aid the cause of Allah, the religion of Allah, then Allah will aid you, and Allah يثبت أقدامكم will plant your feet firmly. Allah will give you thabat. Allah will give you courage, and Allah will give you steadfastness. And Allah Taala will give you firmness and stability upon the truth. And this subject matter, and he is the goal of the believer, the objective of the believer, and that the believer knows that the izz is with Allah Taala. All dignity is with Allah Subhanahu. Wa Ta'ana was reported that a man once said to an Hassan al Basri, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, as is found in Kitab al Zuhd by Imam Ahmed, and is found likewise by Abu, uh, with Abu Na'im in Kitab al Hilya. That a man came to an Hassan al Basri, Rahmatullahi alayhi, and said, Inni uridu safaran fazawidni. He said that I intend to travel, I intend to embark upon a journey, fazawidni. So give me something to take with me, give me some provision for my journey. Faqala ibn akhi, a'izza amr allahi haythu kunta. He said, O oh nephew, and he with and he's saying this and he in terms of affection, O oh nephew, Aizza Amr Allah Haythu Kunta Honor Allah's commandments, Allah's matter, Allah's religion, Allah's orders, Allah's commandments, Haythu Kunta. Haythu, the scholars they say, and yashmalu al azmina wal amkina. It's a word, and wherever and whenever, at all times and all places. 
honor the commandments of Allah, the religion of Allah, wherever you are and whenever that is, you izzak Allah at all times and all places, and Allah will honor you. And Allah will honor you. And this was the understanding of the Salaf al Salihin that the greatest means to bring about honor in this world and the next, to bring about strength and dignity in this world and the next, and to bring about the good of this world and the next, and to ward off all harm in this world and the next, of any sort, large or small, from the pricking of a thorn into the to mechanized machines of war, and he mechanized warfare. And he is to honor the religion of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala and to fix one's heart and to fix one's conduct and to obey Allah and obey the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is highlighted in a tremendous advice that is reported by Al Imam Al Hafiz Abu Bakr ibn Abi Dunya Rahmatullah Alaihi. In his book, Al-Ikhlasu wa Niyyah, with his chain of transmission to Ma'aqil ibn Ubayd al-Jazari from the ulama of the Jazeera of Iraq, the area of Mosul, and in likewise from Sufyan ibn Uyayna, is reported elsewhere, the great ulama of the people of Mecca, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, and likewise reported by Ibn Aun, and in one wording Abu Aun and Ibn Aun right, from the scholars of Iraq of Al Basra if I recall correctly that they said Kana Ahlul Khair and in one wording Kana Til Ulama O Kana Al Ulama Idal Takaw Yusi Baaduhum Baadin Bi Haula il Kalimat wa Ida Rabu كَتَبَ بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضُ That the righteous people of the past when they would meet each other they would advise each other with the following advices and they are three advices in number and when they were apart meaning back in their homelands or apart from each other one traveling and the other being in his place of residence then they would write the following advices to each other. Man aslaha sariratahu aslahallahu ala niyata. That whoever fixes their sarira, whoever fixes their sarira, meaning their heart, or their private conduct, both are understood and they are connected to each other. And whoever fixes their intention, meaning fixes their heart, and what their heart wants, what is inside of them, and what they do on the con in the confines of their home in private, because a person's conduct in private is an evidence of their sincerity or lack thereof. Aslaha Allahu ala niyata, and Allah Taala will correct and fix their exterior. Whoever fixes their private conduct and fixes their intention in their heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fix their alaniya, meaning what is external in their situation, meaning their behavior and their matters in general, their statements and their actions and their conduct. وَمَنْ أَصْلَحَ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ أَصْلَحَ اللَّهُ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ النَّاسِ And whoever fixes what is between him and Allah, then Allah will repair and fix what is between him and other people. Meaning the more a person loves Allah and obeys Allah, the more Allah will cause that person to be loved and accepted. And the more the person fears Allah, the more Allah will cause others to have reverential fear, ru'ub and haybah for that person. As comes from Bayd ibn Umair, as is found in the Musanaf of, or as is found rather in Kitab al-Iman by Ibn Abi Shayba and Hafiz Abu Bakr. From Ubaid ibn Umar that he said Al-Iman Huyub or Hayub and he the Iman and he Iman faith and the believer and he is respected and he faith and the believer is respected and, and he is pure respect 
And so a person who fixes what is between him and Allah by fearing Allah and respecting Allah, then Allah will cause him to be respected and Allah will cause him to be venerated for people to have reverence of that person. And whoever hopes for the reward of Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, and he acts accordingly and works for the reward of Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make him maharul raja, somebody who others expect good from, and he hope good from, and that sort of thing. The more a person repairs what is between him and Allah, the more Allah will repair what is between him and the people. Woman. عَمِلَ لِآخِرَتِهِ وَفِي لَفْضٍ اَحْتَمَّ بِأَمْرِ آخِرَتِهِ أَصْلَحَ اللَّهُ دُنْيَاهُ And whoever works for their hereafter gives concern and importance to their hereafter and Allah Ta'ala Ta will fix their worldly affairs meaning that Allah will bring about الرزق والحداية والنصر والأمن والسلام والعافية for that person Allah will bring about sustenance and wealth and sufficiency and kifaya and guidance and victory and safety and well being for that person because they work for their hereafter. And Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala mentions these advices at the end of his tremendous book, which is a very important entry level book for a person who wants to study the works of Ibn Qayyim that is called Zad al Muhajir ir Allah. The provision of the one who is journeying to Allah Taala after any over a hundred or hundred fifty pages or so of advices about getting close to Allah and the migration to Allah and journeying towards Allah Taala upon the path of the Sunnah, he says, "وَقَدْ كَانَ يُغْنِي عَنْ كَثِيرٍ مِنْ هَذَا التَّطْوِيلِ ثَلَاثُ وَصَايَةٍ." He said that perhaps much of what I have discussed at great length here could have been skipped past and it would have been sufficient to have just mentioned three advices that the Salaf al used to write to each other and until he said and these three advices the proof for the veracity of these claims that these things are true is wujuduha is what you find in existence. A jarrab tajid, meaning if you try, you'll see that this is the reality. That by working for Allah in the hereafter and fixing what fixing what is between you and Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, by the Muslims doing this individually and as communities and collectively as a nation, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala will suffice them from the harms of the people. And that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala will give them victory. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them honor. And that Allah will remove, remove humiliation from them. Sometimes things get so complicated and so convoluted and so confusing to the untrained eye. And to a person who lacks insight and lacks vision and foresight. that it seems that problems are intractable. A person finds herself, or a nation finds herself in a quagmire, they find themselves in a situation any, that it feels like any conflict and fighting, and destruction and devastation and so on and so forth will never be removed. And the answer to the problems could be something as simple as returning back to their prayer. Returning back to obedience, repenting to Allah, tabarak wa ta'an, and the answers may be so simple that they, when they are issued and when they are given, that it almost feels like an insult. It almost feels like an insult to those who are going through hardship and going through calamity and difficulty. And when they hear those advices, they think that the matter must be much more complicated, much more difficult than just repenting to Allah, tabarak wa ta'ana. And however, when things are outside of our control and as lay people, we are not people of authority, we are not politicians, we are not people who any, have the levers of power in our hand and that sort of thing, any controlling 
I need diplomacy and I need diplomatic matters and that sort of thing. And then we do what is possible for us. What is possible for us, and we take the path of least resistance, and we take the most straightforward approach, as Allah commanded, and to approach homes from their front doors. And you go through the front door, take the direct approach. And the direct approach for victory are five matters that we're going to highlight for the duration of this talk, inshallah ta'ala. And that are explained in the most beautiful way by the scholars of Islam and in the books of Tafsir and elsewhere. And that the details of which, and he could probably fill a, a, a few volumes in reality. Because all of Islam, in fact, go back to these five matters that are found in the statement of Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Anfal in verses I want to say 45 and 46 no, 45 and 46 of Surah Al-Anfal and the subject matter of Surah Al-Anfal before mentioning these five things is Asbab al-Nasr these are not the only things that are mentioned in Surah Al-Anfal that are the causes of victory However, these five things in particular, they are the linchpin of victory. They are the crux of the matter. They are the core and the heart of the discussion of how to achieve victory as an ummah. How to achieve victory as an ummah. And they are the statement of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ana. Ya ayyuhan adhina amanu, O you who believe, إِذَا لَقِيْتُمْ فِي أَتَنْ When you meet a faction of the enemy upon the battlefield, فَثْبُوتُ Then do the following things. Have the bat First, and he stand your ground, be firm. Meaning be brave, and do not be cowardly. So this is the first means, courage. Courage, and courage is not something that is just mustered at the moment. And it's not something that a person, uh, the, when the metal of a person is tested, then any end of imtihan, you could have been inside, no, you had. And as I said, when trialing and testing occurs, and your person is either humiliated or they are honored and dignified. And so, any shaja'a is something that a person has to build herself up to. And we'll discuss this, inshallah ta'ala, and he briefly. The second thing, فَاثْبُوتُ وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا And remember Allah much and often. Remember Allah much and often. Meaning even in the heat of battle. Remember Allah much and often. The person who remembers of Allah تبارك وتعالى في الرقاء يعرف الله في الشدة As we know, and who glorifies and remembers Allah تبارك وتعالى and shows Allah who He is. And remembers Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala and knows Allah in good times and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will know that He is worthy of His help in Shiddah in hard times. So all of these five things are gonna be like this. And in a situation of relative ease and comfort for most of us living in lands that are relatively safe and tranquil, and in seeing what is happening to our brothers abroad. And then we take the ibrah, seeing what has happened to Muslims across the world, not just now, but any for centuries. We take the lesson. We take the lesson, and so that we are building ourselves up to be brave and firm and have steadfastness and to remember Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala in times of ease. So that when the hard times come, uh, we have the wherewithal. We have the wherewithal. Remember Allah much and often so that you have the hope. Perchance you may be successful. Thirdly, obey Allah and the Messenger. Obey Allah and the Messenger. Fourthly, وَنَتَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْحَبَ رِيحُكُمْ 
do not differ and dispute between one another. فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْحَبَ رِيْحُكُمْ فَتَفْشَلُوا That's that you become futile and cowardly and lose your strength. وَتَذْحَبَ رِيْحُكُمْ And you lose your reih. You lose your reih. And your strength meaning. And it is found in the books of Tafsir and it is found in the Sunnah. And that whenever the believers were victorious that the winds would be in their favor. The actual physical winds. This is a word that is also used metaphorically. And when the winds change, and the winds of victory come, so on and so forth, it is used across cultures around, and across time and places and various societies and that sort of thing. And he, but it is physically the case as well. And, he, and he, that the winds will be in your favor. Allah Ta'ala will subject and he, the creation to aid you. And he, in ways that you can't even realize. So do not dispute, lest that you become futile and weak and cowardly. And lose your reh. And he lose the winds of victory and lose your strength. Wasbiru and be patient. In Allah Sabirin. Indeed, Allah is with those who are patient. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those who are patient. So these five things, the first being courage, the second being remembering Allah much and often, and including that is a dua. The third being obedience to Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The fourth being uh, unity and not dividing. And the fifth being patience. These are the keys to victory. And the Muslim must raise himself and raise his or her children upon this. It is the way that children must be socialized. It is the way that children must be prepared for adulthood. These are the uh, hallmarks of maturity and strong-mindedness. It's what clears the mind of the believer and gives him the resolve that he needs and he to stand up to any challenge and any hardship and any difficulty in the path of da'wah. These five matters, they deserve closer inspection. And so we'll take them individually uh, with some brevity, inshallah ta'ala, without going into too much detail. As for the first matter, the matter of uh, resolve and courage, and Imam Shaykh Sa'adi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says in his book, Fatah al-Rahim and Malik al-Alam, that the matter of a shaja'ah of courage, and he is, that this is a matter of tremendous moral character and virtuous ethics. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to imbue and commanded us to have in a great number of verses in the Quran. And as a matter of fact, he says all of the verses about jihad, about striving and struggling with the holy struggle and the righteous struggle, which is to spread the da'wah, I mean, with the tongue and with wealth, and with any physical strength and power, and all those sorts of things. I need to take all of the means that are necessary to strengthen the ummah, which is the reality of jihad. And he, all of the verses that speak about jihad are about courage, and they are about courage. He says, وَأَثْنَى عَلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ وَأَخْبَرْ أَنَّهُ تَرِيقَ الرُّسُلْ وَسَادَاتِ الْخَلْقِ And Allah has praised those who have courage. He has praised those who are brave and bold. And He has informed us that it is the path and the way of the messengers and of those who are the people of Su'udud, the Sadat al-Khalq, I mean the leaders of the creation, and the leaders of the people is a necessary trait for leadership and he has forbidden the opposites the opposite of courage he has forbidden from al-jubun wal-fashal wal-khawf min al-khalq fi sabiri jihad al-da'wa wa fi sabiri jihad al-silah he has forbidden against cowardice and futility and weakness and being afraid of the creation as it relates to the path of striving and calling to Allah Ta'ala and the path of striving when it comes to fighting against 
and those who are and who wish harm against the Muslims and for the people of authority. وَهَذَا الْخُلُقُ الْجَلِيلِ قَدْ يَكُونُ غَرِيزَةً مَعَ الْعَبْدِ وَيَتَقَوَّ بِمُجِيبَاتِ الْإِيمَانِ He says that this majestic and honorable and luminous characteristic of courage it may be innate, it may come natural for a person. Some people are naturally bold and audacious and brave and that sort of thing. And their natural courage can be strengthened by the dictates of faith. Meaning the more they know about Allah and the hereafter and the prophets and the messengers and the angels and all of the things and the qadr of Allah and all those things that are part and parcel of iman, of one's creed and belief system, and that they strengthen in their courage, that their courage becomes strong, their courage becomes strong. And other people, another person, may need to train themselves to be like that. They may need to discipline themselves and train themselves and force themselves to be brave and courageous. And to take the methods that aid him in being brave and courageous. He says, Courage is the strength and the stability of the heart. The thabat and the quwa of the heart, the strength and the thabat and the stability of the heart, the firmness of the heart. And a person maintaining their composure and having tranquility and he in vexing circumstances, any in any urgent instances, any things that are of great importance. And in hard difficult matters. And upsetting situations, a person is in need of courage. And everyone needs courage. Especially those who are ru'asa, who are the leaders of the people. الَّذِينَ تُنَاتُوا بِهِمِ الْمُحِمَّاتِ وَالْأُمُورِ And those that matters of great importance are entrusted to. فَحَاجَتُهُمْ إِلَيْهِ ضَرُورِيَا May Allah give the rulers of the Muslims, and the leaders of the Muslims strength. And may he give us strength and courage as the leaders of our homes and of and as the faces of our communities. And may he forgive us for our shortcomings. And so the Quran invites to courage and to every means that aids a person in courage. And Allah has commanded us, for example, in the Quran to fear him alone. And not to fear the creation. And so when a person restricts their fear to fearing Allah alone and knows with certainty that people, that the creation can never have the ability to benefit him nor harm him except by the will of Allah, then his heart becomes strong. He said, and then when he puts his trust upon Allah, and his dependency upon Allah grows strong, then the strength of his heart will increase. His heart will get stronger and stronger. Likewise, in his book, al riyadh Al-Nadira, Shaykh Sa'adi, rahimahullah ta'ala, speaks at length about courage, and the importance of courage, and the harm of cowardice, and how a person trains their self, and trains their children to be courage, uh, to, to have courage, and to be courageous. And he mentions some matters of great importance, and one of them that we'll uh, quickly mention, and he is the importance of uh, making one's children speak in public 
I need to include in that is recitation of the Quran. I need to put one's children forward to lead the Salat in the home. I need their male children, that sort of thing. I need to have I need the children give advices I need in front of the parents or in public gatherings. I need mahafan and that sort of thing. I need as long as they are safe from al uh, ujub any being conceited or anything of the sort, but just to train them to be courageous with public speaking and with other things, to assign responsibility to the children, all these sorts of matters. And it is for the Muslims to, to raise themselves and to raise their children and their offspring to be brave and to be courageous and to have healthy audacity for the sake of Allah Ta'ala Ta And after a lengthy introduction, that mirrors and is very similar to what he mentioned in the uh, first passage. He says, Rahimullah Ta'ala, Famata Kawya Imanul Abdi Billahi Wabi Kawaihi Wa Kadarihi Wa Kawya Yakino with Tawabi wal Aqab. That when a person has the following things and they that are connected to faith and connected to one's creed, then their shaja'a and he will their courage will be authentic. And it will be a strong courage. He says, when the faith and the belief of a servant about Allah is strong, what they believe about Allah and His names and His attributes, and His right to be worshipped, and what they have strong belief that Allah preordains all matters. They believe in the qadha and the qadr of Allah, ta'ala. When they have a strong belief in the reward and the punishment of Allah, when they have complete Reliance and dependency upon Allah with the qatu hubi kifayatillah. And when they are, when they have conviction and certainty about the fact that Allah is sufficient for them. And they know for certainty that the creation can neither harm nor benefit. And that their forelocks are in the hand of Allah tabarak wa ta'ana. And when they know the amazing, beneficial effects that come as a result of courage, and when knowledge of these matters and inward states it becomes firm in his heart, Then his heart will be strong and his uh, fuad and his emotions and he will be calm and his composure will be calm and he will advance towards every statement and action that is beneficial to advance towards. As for the second matter, the importance of a dhikr, the statement of Allah, Wadkurullah Kathiran. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much and often, so that you may be successful. And Imam al Hafiz ibn al Jawzi Abu al Faraj Baghdadi, Rahmatullah alayhi, he says in Zad al Masir, his tafsir book, about the statement of Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala. And remember Allah much and often so as you may be successful. He says, Anahud, he says, Fihi qawlan, That there are two things that are said by the scholars about this statement of Allah. The first is that it is a dua wa nasr. A dua bin nasr. And it is to make dua for victory. What is meant by the remembrance of Allah, remember Allah much and often, is to remember Allah in such a way that you call upon Allah for victory. That you are asking Allah for honor and dignity and victory and triumph and so on and so forth. And the second is dhikrullahi ala al-itlaq. And to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unrestrictedly at all times and in every vexing circumstance to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. It was reported that Qatada, as is mentioned by Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala, said about this verse, If tarad Allahu dhikrahu inda ashghali ma yakun, inda dharbi bis suyuf. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ob obligated upon us and ordered us to remember him and glorify him and he, at the most busiest, at the busiest time, at the busiest time possible. And he, and that, 
ashghali ma yakun at the busiest possible time which is any during the clashing of swords any when and when is in the heat of battle even in this situation where a person's mind is occupied and their focus is uh honed upon what they are engaged in and that sort of thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded the believers even in such a situation to engage in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Al-Baqa'i rahmatullahi alayhi the great mufassir he says لِأَنَّ ذَلِكَ أَمَارَةُ صِدْقِ فِي الْعْتِمَارَ عَلَيْهِ وَحْدَ And because a person in all situations, especially in hard times and times of affliction and calamity and devastation and that sort of thing and great fear, and that is an evidence and a proof of a صدق and of determination and trueness in one's faith and their dependency upon Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala alone. وَذَٰلِكَ مُوجِبُ النَّصْرِ لَا مَحَانَ And that is something that inexorably, unavoidably, or any, undoubtedly, and he causes victory and triumph for the person to be constantly in a state of dhikr, remembering Allah and glorifying and praising Allah. تَبَارَكُ تَعَانَ Likewise, Sadiq Hassan Khan, he said in Fath al-Bayan, عِنْدَ جَزَعِ قُلُوبِكُمْ يعني فإن ذكره يعين على ثبات في الشدائد. Remember Allah much and often, meaning He said, and when your hearts are in a state of jaza, when your hearts are unsettled and in a state of terror and fear, to remember Allah تبارك وتعالى. For indeed, remembering Allah يعين على ثبات في الشدائد. And He helps and aids a person to be firm and to have resolve and to have steadfastness during adversity and hardship and calamities. وَقِيلَ الْمَعْنَ أُثْبُتُ بِقُرُوبِكُمْ وَذْكُرُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ And some have said that what is meant is to be firm with your hearts and to remember Allah with your tongues. And to remember Allah with your tongues. To be firm in your heart and remember Allah with your tongue. For indeed the heart قَدْ يَسْكُنْ عِنْدَ لِقَاءَ And during conflict the heart may be calm. However, the tongue and he isn't calm. And the tongue may say various statements and he may utter certain phrases and he that are incorrect and he or any a person may find themselves unable to speak out of fear. And so they have been ordered and he for their hearts to make their hearts firm and to use their tongues to remember Allah Ta'ala to strengthen their resolve. So Allah commanded them, Sadiq Hasan Khan, Rahmatullah Alayhi, he said, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala commanded them to remember him and glorify him and praise him in hard times so that they can combine between and couple between the firmness and the stability of the heart and the tongue. Qila wa yanbaghi an yakuna dhikru fi hadhihi al-hal bi maqanahu ashabu talut. He says, and it is befitting, some of the scholars have said, that the dhikr that is made and the dua that is made in such a circumstance is what was said by Ashabu Talut, and he, those who fought against uh, uh, Goliath and the army of Goliath who were with Saul. And he, in Surah Al Baqarah, Rabbana Afrig Alayna Sabran wa Thabit Aqadamana wa Ansurna Ala Al Qawm Al Kafirin. O oh Allah, shower upon us, place upon us great patience and make our feet firm and give us victory over a disbelieving people. He says in this verse contains within it an evidence that it is legislated and legitimate to make dhikr in all circumstances and situations. Even in such a circumstance in which the heart trembles and shakes. And in which the eyes of the people and he are uh, in a state of fear and terror. And he, so included in the dhikr of Allah is a dua. Is a dua. And he has, has been highlighted in the statement of Ibn al Jawzi and highlighted here in the statement of Sadiq Hassan Khan. Rahmatullahi alayhima. And this is in line 
with what is found all throughout the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam of the importance of a du'a as a means of victory. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymi rahimahullah ta'ala he says al Muslimun fi mashariq al ard wa magharibiha qulubuhum wahida muwaliyatun lillahi wa li rasulihi wa li ibadihi al mu'minin that the Muslims in the east of the earth to its west, their hearts are one and united, having loyalty to Allah, His messengers, and His believing servants, and having enmity for the enemies of Allah, His messenger, and His believing servants. And their sincere hearts and their righteous du'as are the army that cannot be defeated and the troops that cannot be forsaken. And so this is something of great importance because when we tell people make dua and when there are troubling things happening in the world then they feel that that is not enough they feel as though any there is something that goes beyond what is legislated any whether that be protesting or whether that be whatever people invent in their minds and suggest with their tongues any of what can be done in difficult circumstances where we have no ability to do anything but make dua and to aid with our wealth if we are able any and those sorts of things and to any make a change ourselves for the better any they feel as though this is enough as though this is weakness as though this is weakness and we say what is even weaker any that what is the weakest thing that a person can do is, is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said ajazukum ajazukum fid dua in one narration eh, that the stingiest of you are those who are most stingy with the salam and those who are the most helpless of you are those who are too helpless to make dua those who are the most helpless in making dua and so when a person has no ability to do anything but make dua and dua is a great weapon in the arsenal of the believer even when the Muslims have great authority and they have great any uh, uddad and adad and they have great weaponry and numbers and so on and so forth, numerical support, superiority and all those sorts of things, then a dua is greater than all of that. A dua is greater than all of that. And this is highlighted by an Imam ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala in his book Adda'u ad dawa He says, وَلَمَا كَانَ صَحَابَةُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ عَلَى مَنْ أُمَّتِي بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَأَفْقَاهُمْ فِي دِينِهِ كَانُوا أَقْوَمَ بِهَذَا سَبَبٍ الدُّعَى وَشُرُوطِهِ وَآدَابِهِ مِنْ خَيْرِهِمْ وَكَانَ عُمَرُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ يَسْتَنْصِرُ بِهِ عَلَى عَدُوِّهِ وَكَانَ أَعْظَمَ جُنْدَيْهِ And since the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ibn Qayyim says in Zad al-Ma'ad or in Da'a were the most knowledgeable of this nation about Allah and His Messenger وسلم, and the most understanding of them in the religion they were the most upright with this means of victory meaning supplication, dua and in carrying out with His proper conditions and etiquettes and anyone else and Umar radiallahu anhu used to seek victory with a dua over his enemy and it was the greatest of his two armies meaning it was the greatest weapon that he spiritual weapon that he had and it was more effective than any physical weapon that he had or any physical uh, uh, superiority or any domination in numbers or in weaponry or anything of the sort. And he used to say to his companions that you are not granted victory by your numbers, but rather you are granted victory from the heavens, meaning from Allah Ta'ala. Ta and he used to say, "Inni la ahmin wahamal ijaba wa lakin hamad du'a, fa in fa ida uhlim tum al du'a, fa in al ijaba tamaa." He said, "I do not worry about whether or not my du'a will be answered, but rather I worry about whether or not I will supplicate to begin with. For when you are inspired to supplicate and make du'a, then the answer is guaranteed to come with it. The response is guaranteed to come with it. And so these means of courage." And dhikr and dua, and yeah, they mean a'adha uh, mayakun nafa. They are from the greatest of things to benefit the believers in perplexing and hard and difficult circumstances and situations and that sort of thing. 
And moving on to the next point, and obeying Allah and obeying the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala in his book Al-Furusiyat al muhammadiya he said that this is the most comprehensive of all of the five means. And when he talks about the five things that are found in those verses in Surah Al-Anfal that we're discussing, the five means of victory, he said they are the, they are the, this is the most effective of all of these means. The most effective of all of these means is to obey Allah and obey the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As for the matter of unity and not differing and that sort of thing, then everything in Islam, all of its beliefs, and all of his acts of worship and abiding by all of his commandments and doing business in the way that Allah has commanded and engaging in marriage and divorce and child custody in a way that Allah has commanded and all of these things are a means of unity and they are that which brings people together they are that which brings people together and so unity and is something that is fostered and is developed in a time of ease and a time of comfort and he, that carries out the benefit of which and he continues in a time of hardship and a time of affliction and that sort of thing. And the last means of victory, the fifth means of victory is patience. Is patience. And we'll close by reading uh, a brief passage from Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala along these lines that is taken from the very beginning of his lengthy book about patience and gratitude. That is called Aidatul Sabirin or the Khiratu Ashakirin. Where he says after the introductory khutbah of the book, he says, Amma ba'du fa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ja'ana asabra jawada la yakbu. He says to proceed, to begin this book, then verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made patience to be a steed that never stumbles, a steed of war that never stumbles. Wasari man and a sword that never bends and an army that is uh, indefeatable and it has made patience to be a fortress that is impenetrable that can neither be demolished nor broken through Patience and victory are like twin brothers. Patience and victory are twin brothers. فَنَصْرُ مَعَ sabr, As the Prophet Sallallahu said, that victory comes with patience. وَالْفَرَجْ مَعَ الْكَرَبْ And he and الفرج, relief comes alongside distress. وَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى And indeed with difficulty is ease. And patience is more guaranteed to bring about victory for the person than uh, the aid of other men. Ansar, and it is more guaranteed to bring about victory for him than Arrijal. Bila Eddatin, Wala, Bila Uddatin, Wala Adad, Wa Mahaluhu Mina Zafar, Kamahala Rasi, Mina Jasad. And it is more guaranteed to bring about victory for him than anything else, any than numerical superiority or weaponry or anything of the sort. And patience coupled with victory is like the head to the body. And the one who is loyal to his word who is true in all that he says, Tabarak wa Ta'ala has guaranteed for the people of patience. And what is crystal clear in his book that he will render their reward to them for having patience without any limit. And he Tabarak wa Ta'ala has informed them that by way of his guidance and his aiding them, and he, that he is with them, that he is with them so long as they have patience, as he says in the end of these two verses in Surah Al Anfal, Wasbiru in Allah Ma'asabirin. And he be patient, indeed Allah is with those who are patient. So we close in this note, Sa'ilin Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, and Yaja'alana Min Ahli Hadihin Khisal Al Khams. And he asking that he 
Tabarak wa ta'ala makes us from those who imbue and incorporate within ourselves any of these five characteristics. And he, although it sounds simple, and he, it is any ma ashana da'awa wa ma as'ab at tatbiq. As our scholars, they say, how easy is it for a person to claim that they can be or are a particular way, and how hard is it to actually implement any such matters? Any that we are sincere and courageous and constantly in the dhikr of Allah and avoid any mindless frivolity, any, and that we engage in a dua and that we increase in obedience and that we repent to Allah wa ta'ala for disobedience and that we any are upon unity in word and deed and creed and belief and intention and in what we are after and the legacies that we are trying to leave behind for our next generation and that we are people of uh, patience and that we have these qualities that are mentioned and here in these verses and it is very easy for a person and to assert that this is possible for them and this is within their grasp however as we said earlier when a person is really put to test them when their metal is tested then they are either honored or they are humiliated we ask Allah to forgive us and to pardon us and to honor Islam and the Muslimin and to humiliate shirk and the mushrikeen wa akhzi a'da'aka a'da'i deen alahumma arfa' anil muslimin and bala fi kulli makan O Allah remove calamity and hardship and tribulation from the Muslims in every place alahumma ruddana ila izzina maraddan jameela May Allah return the Muslims back to their izz and their majd, their glory and their honor with a beautiful return and that is not done except by way of beneficial knowledge and righteous deeds هذا وصلى الله عليه وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبته وسلم جزاكم الله خيرا طيب there are a few questions there are common questions about such a topic the first says that some people believe that the difficulties facing the Ummah can be overcome with demonstration and protest and even overthrowing Muslim governments that they deem to be incompetent. How should the Sunni respond to such calls? And this could be a lecture in and of itself. And the response is what was just mentioned. And these are not the asbab of al-Nasr. But rather these are the asbab of al-Fashal. These are not the means of victory, they are the means of defeat. And the means of the Muslim losing their strength. Could you imagine anything that could be a worse idea in a time of vulnerability and weakness and the Muslims having infighting between each other? Muslim uh, populations rising up to overthrow their governments because they feel as though their governments are incompetent. I mean, just the economic devastation that was caused. I mean, many of us live, most of us live through the Arab Spring. It was a za'amu, as they so supposedly called it and claimed to be the Arab Spring, and it was really the Arab Fall. It was the Kharif and Arabi. And we saw what happened worldwide. I mean, every day of demonstrating and protesting and peaceful protesting while they were flipping over, you know, uh, the vehicles of the security forces and lighting them on fire and throwing Molotov cocktails, right? But peaceful protest is protest, they, uh, they claim. And he, every day, and he caused the loss of billions of dollars or millions of, hundreds of millions of dollars. And he, in the gross domestic uh, output of the country and all those sorts of things, and he, the flow of commerce, and he, the stability of those countries was... Uh, undermined and no benefit came from any of that but what came from that was was power vacuums and terrorist factions and people with uh their own agendas and ulterior motives and so on and so forth who were really inspired by western models of uh a thora and a revolutionary the revolutionary faith of fire in the minds of men and he that have their roots and, and antiquity, and he have their roots, and he and the ideas of the Greeks and the Romans, and he to the point that Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu, 
it was authentic from him that he said, Annie, that you people are like a Rome. You are like the Romans. They never have a ruler except that they want to depose him. And he's speaking to some of the people in his time, at the end of the time of the companions and the early time of the Tabi, and speaking to some of those who want to stand up against the rulers and against their governors and so on and so forth and cause instability in the lands and in the provinces and the territories of the Muslims that you people are like the Romans. People are like the Romans. And these are the ideas of the Kufar. And he to uh, play upon and to manipulate the emotions of people, to use propaganda. And he to uh, turn uh, the court of public opinion against the rulers and that sort of thing. And a person is wittingly or unwittingly in, a weapon in the hand of the enemy. When they call for uh, uh, protest and they call for overthrowing of governments and so on and so forth. And the matter of protesting and demonstrating is a display of weakness, a display of of, uh, of uh, inability, and it is something that causes the enemy to gloat over the misfortune of the Muslim and to uh, uh, mock and ridicule the Muslim. It's not a sign or a proof or, or a, a means of strength in any regard, and it's something that and he, there is no basis for in Islam. And, he, and when it was done in the history of Islam, it led to bloodshed. It led to bloodshed. And so this is not something that is legislated. It's something that has uh, no tangible benefit. And the harm of it always any supposed imagined benefit it has been warned against by the scholars. And it is from the means of democracy, the, de and the, the de democratic process that everybody's entitled to have a voice and so on and so forth. And from that is to... Uh, quote unquote, pe and he, uh, peace uh, peaceably assemble to come together, and he and everybody to hold placards and hold signs and you know to cause a commotion and so on and so forth. And look at the mafasa that come with it, any of the free mixing between the genders, any of bringing out the ghawra, any bringing out the most ignorant of the people, any people who don't know how to pray correctly, people who don't know how to make wudu correctly, bringing the Muslims together with the non Muslims and and he all in sundry, kullu man habwa dab, and he every type of person imaginable, and he whether they are a person who is hourly upright or a person who is uh, hourly a homosexual or hourly and he a sexual deviant or anything of the sort, and he bringing all these people together, we all agree that this is a tragedy or calamity, this particular incident or that or the third, and he, this is something that anybody with two eyes and a soft, and he knows that it is wrong, but this is not something that can affect any type of change but rather the means of change and the means of victory are what have been highlighted and and it is for the muslims to learn their religion and implement their religion to busy themselves with good and dua to spend their wealth for the sake of allah wa ta'ala to send their wealth ala aidi jihat ma'amuna as was stated by shaykh muqbar rahimullah ta'ala and he send their wealth to trustworthy uh, 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 organizations and your trustworthy entities that can uh, spend their wealth and to aid the Muslims and that sort of thing as opposed to sending it to the Kufar or the Hizbis or anything of the sort. And so that is a, a, a brief response to that doubt. The second question, what role can parents play in helping their children to navigate what's often shown explicitly in media depicting the, depicting the plight, death and destruction of Muslims which can cause these children to undergo psychological trauma? Hey, this is a very important question. It's a very, very important question. And we need to safeguard the innocence of our children and limit what they have access to and what they place their eyes upon on, the, on social media and off of social media and the regular media and on the social media, so on and so forth. Any of the outrage, any in the, 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 you know, a justifiable outrage, any but in a way that thought ila wara, and there's no benefit behind any 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 you being being upset and devastated and so on and so forth, and feeling helpless and feeling defeated, and it breeds within a person dhul, any humiliation and a defeatist mentality and that sort of thing, and and it is for the parents to advise their children and to take the physical means that are required to limit what their children have access to. And children, when we say children, 
as parents, yani our children, many of us we have, uh, I and many of us have adult children, we still call them children, right? And your children are children even if they're 40, you still call them children. So we could be speaking about uh, children that are as young as six, seven, eight years old who have access to mobile devices and in a harmful way where they're coming across particular information. And he, or we could be speaking about uh, prepubescent children or adolescent children, or we could be speaking about teenagers and all these sorts of things. And he, but whatever the case, and he, we have to be careful and we have to be diligent in having these conversations with our children and uh, discussing with them. And he, that these things are not new. And that this situation will never be changed until the Muslims change for the better. Allah Ta'ala Qur'an Surah Turad he said, For example, you tell them that Allah said in Surah Turad that the person has angels that are appointed to him that alternate in shifts in the morning and evening who protect them by the command of Allah. A person is assigned guardian angels, right? By Allah to protect them from har hardship and devastation. Then Allah said in the very next verse, In Allah la yughayyuru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyuru ma bi anfusin. And in Allah la yughayyur does not change the condition of a people till they change what is in their selves. And so we have to improve for the better. If we make a change for the worse, then the same thing that is befalling Muslims in other countries can befall us. We're in an even more vulnerable situation. We don't live in a Muslim country. If this can happen in Muslim lands, but they have numer numerical superiority and they're surrounded by other Muslim countries who are also unable to remove this humiliation from them. And then what about us living in Western lands? What about us living around the disbelievers, so on and so forth? And this impresses upon us the importance of uh, removing ourselves from these places and when we have the ability and, and building ourselves up uh, and raising our children with a desire to live in the lands of Islam and not make this our permanent abode and all these sorts of things. So we impress upon them and when people change for the better, then Allah will increase his support and increase his protection for them. And when they make a change for the worse, any, then من يحين الله فما له من مكرم And whoever Allah humiliates, and no one can honor. So Allah Tabarak wa said this after mentioning that everything in the heavens and everything in the earth and the and the and the the any a shajar wa dawab wa kathiru min al nas yani shams wa al qamar and the sun and the moon and the stars and the shrubs and the trees and the animals all make sajda for Allah and many people make sajda for Allah and many people are deserving of punishment for not making sajda for Allah. وَمَنْ يُحِنِ اللَّهُ وَمَنْ يُحِنِ اللَّهُ فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ مُكْرِمٍ and whoever Allah humiliates and no one can show honor. Meaning the person who leave off their prayer. And he have incurred upon himself humiliation from Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala. And so impress upon the children the importance of the prayer. Impress upon them the importance of holding fast to their religion. And staying close to the people of righteousness and sunnah and knowledge and so on and so forth. So that they can be protected from such a situation. And to make dua for their brothers in other countries. And to not trouble their hearts. To not trouble their hearts with such matters in a way that is not beneficial. And he, to, and he have uh, a broad awareness about such things is beneficial. However, I need to look at these images, to look at any people being crushed in their homes, to look at uh, entire cities being bombarded and he, with aerial warfare and so on and so forth. And it's something that the adult mind cannot fully grasp it. It's something that the adult mind any any will be affected by psychologically, let alone a child's mind. And so we have to be diligent as parents to uh, take the means to mitigate the harm and to uh, minimize their access to what they see and what they hear and what they read and the images that are uh, uh, disseminated and that sort of thing. The third and last question, what type of relationship should a son have with his father such that he heeds his advice and warnings and not fall, fall prey to wrong crowds in the life of the street? And this is something that goes both ways. 
This is something that goes both ways. And he is upon the son. I need to trust his father, to trust the advice of his father, and to know that his parents in general are looking out for his well-being. And I say his parents in general because often the time, oftentimes the children that we lose to the streets are coming from single parent households where the father is not around and if the father is around then he's an absentee father and he's an absentee father so bonding a talahum needs to occur I mean, there needs to be a close connection and, he, and the effect that the father has upon the son and showing him manliness and showing him dignity and showing him honor and showing him al qanaa being satisfied with having less and they're not being uh, attracted to the glitz and the glamour of the street lifestyle and fast money that comes with fast death and all of, I mean, the loss of freedom and the loss of uh, dignity and honor and so on and so forth. And there's no honor amongst thieves. There's no honor amongst uh, these sorts of people, any low lives and that sort of thing. Any of those people that are like wolves. And in order to be a wolf, you have to be a wolf. And in order to be amongst the wolves, you have to be a wolf. Right? And he has a poet once stated, and he who is not whoever is not a wolf amongst the wolves will be will be devoured by them. Right? And many of us personally uh, witness that and observe that in our lives growing up. You know, as a teenager myself before Islam, I witnessed uh, years of that up and uh, too close for comfort. And, he, and though the the physical effects and the psychological effects, and the uh, and he, the fact that a person can make a decision in his teenage years that will affect him for the rest of his life, and he, about who he has children with, or a decision about whether or not to stand his ground and fight, and he, or whether or not to uh, uh, seek retribution against those who have harmed him or harmed any those that he has high regard for anything of the sort, any uh, impulsive decision could affect the rest of his life, it could land him in jail, or it could land him in hell. And the effect of the father, any, any, in reality, which you are fighting against as fathers, which you are fighting against as fathers, and he is um, very weak, and he, that life should not be appealing at all to a Muslim child. A Muslim child who has natural shyness and modesty about their self, when they see such a thing, and when they see such a life, when they see such people, and they should uh, be disgusted by what they see. They should be disgusted by what they see. And he, in comparison to the Muslim community and the men in the Muslim community and the role models they have in the Muslim community, there should be no appeal. And he, our communities and our households should not be so weak that we lose our children to such a feeble facade of pseudo masculinity and any uh, uh, machismo and so on and so forth and people are pretending to be tough and rough to the end of it I mean that is something that is very uh, obviously uh, weak and it's something very obviously harmful and a Muslim youth when he sees that any male or female should have no attraction to that they should see the devastation of that and he, how that ruins the lives of people and he with venereal diseases and he, with physical ailments with uh, you know with uh, injuries that a person cannot um, that may affect them for the rest of their life you know I, I'll divulge to you that I, I personally I have a neurological um, uh, malady that I suffer from without going into detail about what it is that affects my speech sometimes that it affects my um, my energy as, a, as I have grown older and I came from fighting as a young person I came from fighting as a young person and I you know tell the youth and I advise the youth and these sorts of that this sort of lifestyle any of violence and this sort of lifestyle of uh, of fake masculinity to the end of it and he is something that uh, landed many of my friends and many of my peers in prison or in their graves. And there is nothing appealing about it. And alhamdulillah, in, here in the United States, we have 
uh, in our communities, many uh, uh, brothers who spent significant time in prison and who can advise the youth and uh, direct the youth away from uh, such toxic and poisonous lifestyles. And alhamdulillah, perhaps you can direct the youth towards some of those recordings and towards some of those advices that are given by uh, brothers who come from those backgrounds. And uh, most of those who come from those backgrounds don't want to talk about them too much, but there are I need some beneficial advices, especially here in the States. I mean, many of our communities are in poor neighborhoods. And many advices have been given about, uh, you know, staying out of prison and avoiding the street lifestyle and so on and so forth that have had uh, shockwaves and great uh, benefit on Muslims in many places, right? In many places. So we ask Allah to uh, allow the Muslim youth to see that Islam is a religion of dignity and honor and that everything outside of Islam is dhul and hawan, humiliation and degradation. And there's no way to live. I ask Allah wa ta'ala to remove hardship from the Muslims and calamity and humiliation from the Muslims in all places. And to realize that by imitating the disbelievers in any lifestyle, whether it is this lifestyle or whether it is any the myth of the self-made man and the myth of the capitalist dream, any the American dream or the Western dream of having any a particular type of uh, consumer lifestyle to the end of it, any that these are just that they are just myths they are just uh, uh, dreams that end in nightmares for people when they disobey Allah and disobey the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we have the best example for us in the Prophets and the early generations of Islam هذا وصلى الله محمد وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم